Hey folks, Kiltman here, Kiltman at your services. How are you all? Hope you're all doing very, very well. And are you feeling Christmassy? It's only about 12 days away, the big day. But are you? Really? Are you? In the UK at the moment, it is probably about minus four where I am right now. And you still can't walk out there because it's just completely iced over and it's a death trap. But not only that, it doesn't matter. No point walking out there because you can't get any transports anyway because all the trains are off on strike, there's no posts coming because they're on strike, the bins have been on strike, uh, border force is on strike, the nurses are on strike. The country is just ground to a halt. Winter of discontent. But we shall endeavour, we shall persevere to have a barrel of fun. Yes, folks, our good friend from the Emerald Isle, Captain Ronnie, yeah, He's, uh, he sent a little, a little aid package of goodwill and merriment. And uh, it's only a little package, so don't worry. I'm not going to be here for hours. But there's some stuff in here which I thought, you're going to want to see this, because it's just great. So, without further ado, let's have a little look-see. I'm playing Escape from New York because <laughs> there was a great little card, which everyone knows, Kurt Russell, I am his biggest devoted fan. King Kurt will rule forever! And uh, my heroes, Snake Plissken, of course, McCready, Jack Burton. Come on now. And it's funny that Captain Ron from the Emerald Isle sends me this stuff as well. So, but look at this, this is a Christmas card. It's, it's the Kurt Carol Singers. Look at that, it's McCready, it's Plissken, it's Jack Burton with the lippy on as well. He's been to the office Christmas too. <laughs> How cool is that? And on the inside, there's the grizzled old old Kurt. Oh, let's get the ring light sorted. Look at that. And it says, Merry Kurtmas. How cool is that? Merry Kurtmas. We wish you a McCready Christmas. We wish you a McCready Christmas. We wish you a McCready Christmas. And a Jack Burton New Year. What? No Pliskin. Well, I'll tell you why there's no Pliskin in the tune, because he doesn't give a fuck about your Christmas or your Santa Claus. There you go. Look at that. How cool is that? I will cherish that. There's a little note inside there as well. And it said, Merry Kirtmas, Chris, to you and the family. Thanks for another year of movies, merch and kilty madness. And I hope to 2023 brings much more. It will. Keep it Celtic, keep it Celtic. And Captain Ronnie. Uh, without any sense of hyperbole or sort of exaggeration 2022 has been the worst year of my life without any shadow of a doubt uh, family stuff grief loss uh, my health massively deplorable uh, career-wise everything seems to be coming to a head and that head is just going to go <laughs> Mount Vesuvius ain't looking good at all but hey well, we've still got whiskey. We can still put a grin on our faces, can't we? Cheers, y'all. Cheers, Ronnie. Next year will be better. Uh, one tip, by the way, is don't watch the news. I've said this before many, many times. The news is just doom and gloom. And if you're getting a relentless barrage of doom and gloom on the TV channels, on your streaming services, on your phone, every bit of news outlet you're getting is telling you how bad things really are. Everything's ground to a halt, we can't afford the cost of living, energy crisis, it's all gonna hit, 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 constantly. And you just can't take so much of it. No, the powers that be know this. That's why the news is always orchestrated and skewed towards the bad, gloomy side of things. And only at the very end, the last 30 seconds you get, oh, and in other news, on a lighter note, um. The pilot on the new space shuttle proposed to the mission controller while it's in, in flight. You know, just something like that, which is so really hackneyed and meant to be really uplifting. But they cram it into the last few seconds of any news broadcast, whilst the rest is predominantly just evil. And I firmly believe that the whole thing is to keep you down, to keep you forever scared. They want a population that's scared. They don't want you having fun. Have fun only when they want you to have fun. And 
good luck with that this Christmas. You know, because all the trains being off, no one can go into town for big parties. And of course, now you've got businesses, bars, restaurants who are threatening with closure because they're not making any money. Because, but everyone who's on strike, I understand why. They're not getting paid enough and they can't keep up. So pretty soon everybody will go on strike. And even the ones who don't go on strike won't be able to go to work anyway because there's no means of getting there. So the country, like in lockdown with the pandemic, will just grind to a halt. And it isn't just this country. Europe is in strife as well. America is in strife. Now, a lot of you guys, especially in America, don't even get to hear about this because America does it the opposite way around. They just fill out just programs of shite and uplifting stuff, optimism, but don't tell you. I mean, there's a happy balance. News should be, you know, a balance of the good and the bad and the ugly. But in America, they're not getting told, a lot of cities, a lot of states are not getting told the real economic pressure that the country itself is under. So they're, they're getting news from other places to try to find out what's really happening. Whereas in our country, it's all bad. <laughs> so I say there's got to be a balance somewhere. I try to achieve that balance by having fun on the channel. And at least for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, sometimes I've even done two hour long videos. Um, for that, that bit of respite, we've got escapism. We've got a bit of salvation away from the grind and the grist, you know, of real life and reality and the rat race. So anyway, what else did we get? Well, we got some bookmarks. He sent some uh, fantastic cards in this range, like previously, and they're like proper cards in this sort of old weathered brown sort of um, cardboard card. And they're all vintage, you know, horror stars and icons. But these are bookmarks. And we have Boris Karloff as the mummy. And the quote is, I can't do Boris Karloff's voice. He has a, a lisp, but I can't really do that. I fell, I fell awake and I mean, I sound like Mike Tyson. I shall awaken memories of love and crime and death. And that's from The Mummy from 1932. And it's a great image there. Because you only see him like that in the first few minutes when he's in, he's in the sarcophagus. And you've got the other guy you know, who, who witnesses him come to life. And all we see is his bandaged hand come down and take the air, the scroll of Thoth. Or, see, if you've got a lisp, that's perfect, isn't it? The scroll of life, and uh, and then he is able to. He, he, the guy goes crazy, and we go, what, what happened? He, goes, he went for a little walk. It's genius. We have the bride, Frankenstein, Elsa Lanchester, and of course it's Doctor Pretorius that says to Colin Clive, Frankenstein, alone you have created the man. Now together we will create his mate. Do -do 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 -do. And the bells ring out. That's very Christmassy. Um, 1935, by the Frankenstein. Awesome. My favourite, of course, the Wolfman. Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman. His signature most iconic role. Played it several times, even against uh, Abbott and Costello. Whoever is bitten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself. Spoken by uh, Madame Uspenskaya as the Gypsy Maliva. The Wolfman, 1941. Awesome stuff. Too good to use as bookmarks, really, aren't they? I'm gonna try, I'm gonna have to try and get some kind of display going with these things. And I love the archaic sort of you know brown card that they're on. Uh, what else do we have? We have, <laughs> and this is great as well. Now I've got to contend with that ring light, of course. It is. Hang on. And while I think on, let's get to it. Bear with me. Uh, is this it? It's Salem's Lot, 1979. Toby Hooper, the TV movie based on Stephen King's classic vampire novel. Uh, and you've got you've got one of the Glick boys at the window scratching. Open the window, Mark. Please, let me in. 
But look at him. It's a little Lego version. Is that is that Danny Glick? One of the Glick boys, anyway. Open the open the window, Mark. Let me in. Isn't that great? And the wonderful strident main theme from Salem's Lot by Harry Suckman. A very unfortunate surname, that. Suckman. But great main theme. Great music overall for Salem's Lot. Cheers again. In fact, that main theme there is very reminiscent of Bernard Herrmann's skeleton fight music from not Chasing the Argonaut, but from Seven Voyage of Sinbad. Very, very similar to that. So, me thinks that Harry Suckman was slightly influenced by that. Okay, let's go on to the main deal then. All right. And again, we shall be musically motivated here. Let's get on to it. And you know it, you love it. And me and Ronnie, and pretty much most of you guys as well, love a bit of Great White, a bit of Carcaridon Carcarius. Jaws, the original and the best. Of course. Look at this. Fantastic. And we have poor Quince getting chomped there. In, even in Funko land, it's still painful to get bitten in half, you know, by a great white char. Quince here as well. Somewhere up there, Snake Pliskin, bringing up the rear. But look at this. And these are art cards again. I've got to see the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. But that's, that's, that's Michael Myers. We're thinking about a shark. He's got these black eyes, these lifeless eyes, like a doll's eyes. Doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over a bite. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't that great? Oh, that's great, great bit of artwork there. Looks like a stormy sky, doesn't it? And, you know, you've got the choppy sea down here. Obviously the logo, Jaws. Don't go in the water, it says. But you've got the eye of the storm here. And what's reflected in it is the orca. You know, Quint's boat. Three men in a boat. Now, that reminds me of the film Orca Killer Whale. Because in that film, which is, again, that was 1976 or 77, and everyone always accused it, oh, it's a Jaws ripoff. It isn't. It's clearly inspired by a Jaws, but it is not a Jaws ripoff. It tells a completely different story. And you're on the side of the mammal. You're on the, you're on the side of the whale, the killer whale. You understand the human's problem, which is Richard Harris. And the two of them are like, you know, they're, they're dueling throughout the seas. And because as the fisherman, um, Richard Harris has accidentally killed the mate of this orca. And as he hauled it on board, it gives birth to it, its child, a calf, as they call him. So this orca loses his, his, his missus and his kid. And orcas make for life. And Ennio Morricone's music, oh sweet Jesus, it's so, so heartbreaking. I love the movie. I was really bad watching it the first time. Well, in fact, any time. But as a kid watching Orca, I had to be dragged out because I was howling and bawling and screaming with distress at this poor, the plight of this poor Orca. But you do see the Orca's eye a lot. Because they, again, like Great Whites, they will come out the water and have a look. A look top side. And, and you do see, you see Richard Harris reflected in his eye. You see his ship reflected in its eye. And you see the death of his mates reflected in his eyes. Well, you know, it's just oh, heartbreaking. So that reminds me of, of Orca, Orca Killer Whale. And the boat in the middle of it is the Orca in the eye of this sort of horrible shark skinned storm. It's wonderful, mate. And if I time that better, that bit of music is what we're going to look at next in art form. Okay, young Chrissy Watkins has gone skinny dipping and her fella that she copped off with has passed out on the, in the sand dunes. And of course, she swims out a little too far. Mayor Vaughan thinks fishing boat comes along, you know, she tires. It's happened before. No, this was not a boating accident. And it wasn't a propeller. And it wasn't Jack the Ripper. It was a shark. <laughs> and uh, she gets chomped, obviously. And her remains will wash up on the beach. Oh, dearie me. Yeah, a little swig of this again. 
to wet my whistle because you're going to love this. This is great. Cheers. This is poor Alex Kintner getting wasted on his, his inflatable yellow raft. Oh, and that's... I've done a video on the woman who plays his mother because she died a couple of years ago and I did a big tribute to her because one of the most impactful scenes in Jaws doesn't even actually have a shark involved in it. It's the slap, forget Will Smith's slap that was heard around the world, where Mrs. Kittner wallops Brody in, in the mush. He knew all those things. And it's still, you know, people go swimming. But still, my boy is dead now. I just wanted you to know that. God, it's it's fantastic, you know. Anyway, we've got to be moving. So we're going to go on to remain. Hey, on remains on the beach because what we've got here, I will have to do some craftiness to try and get around that ring light. But what is it? It's a beach scene. You've got Brody, and uh, yeah, I'm an islander. <laughs> You've got the guy that was, you know, she must have drowned, you know. And he's going to go, you mean she ran out on you? No way! <laughs> Here's the beach. Look at the outline of the shark as well. The clouds have the shark fin. There's the mouth, the sea and the clouds become the approaching great white, threatening Amity Island. Brody and the other young guy. But over here, over here folks, you've got on his knees, just playing with the sand after having blown his whistle to alert Brody. You've got Len Hendricks, Deputy Len Hendricks, who's just, he's, he's just found all that's left of Chrissy Watkins. Brody will come up and see it. He'll, put, he'll stop your lad from seeing it. Just the hand sticking out and the crab is all over it. Oh my God. Let's turn around that way, might get a better. Look at that. How is it other people use ring lights on these videos and don't get any of this kind of grief? Mine just goes supernova every time. I'll try it that way down. Isn't it great? You can't see her remains. And in fact, if we're going to be deadly accurate, Hendrix would be absolutely fair to all. You've got the, you've got the picket fences there. The, the kids have been karateing the picket fences. <laughs> Uh, he'd be, he's actually higher up than that, but it's still a wonderful image and it's so evocative. The terrifying motion picture from the terrifying number one bestseller, Jaws. And it's perfect the way that it's always got the, the triumvirate of names. In the middle, Robert Shaw. On the left, as you look at it, Roy Scheider. On the right, as you look at it, Richard Dreyfus. Dreyfus and Scheider are at equal billing. In the middle, and also above is Robert Shaw, because Robert Shaw was the, um, the, the, the big, biggest, best known actor in the movie, to appear in the movie. But let's just look at it again. Let's see what you can see. Let's try and, oh, that, that, not too bad. Oh, fucking light. There you go, that's probably got it the best. The shark is zooming in. Sort of like a surreal, ecological, meteorological, Phantom shark made out of clouds and the sea. Hey, oh, it's the biggest, most primal, ethereal bogeyman going. Speaking of bogeyman, um, Jeffrey Kramer, who plays Len Hendricks, deputy, got a much more expanded role in Jaws 2, of course, um, and he's great. Went on to do a lot of TV stuff and become a producer as well, but he's also in Halloween 2. Yeah, Rick Rosenthal's Halloween 2. And he plays the um, the is it the pathologist. They've just hit Ben Tramer, uh, who's wearing a Michael Myers mask, but he's got blo the blonde fright wig on it. And uh, Hanfield's finest, the most inept coppers in the history of copperage, um, smacks into him as he's crossing the road and plows him into a parked van. Whoa! He just goes up in flames and he's there, uh, pinned to this van, totally barbecued. Then you get the scene of like <clears throat> the pathologist is trying to like where he's, he's got he's got he's only young he's got no feelings or has he, has he got feelings? Can't remember now if he's got feelings or not. And he's like the, the gums are intact, everything. I'm not going to know if this is Michael Myers or not until we've done a full X-ray and everything like that, full dental records. And like Myers is Myers, Loomis is there going. <clears throat> then we have to assume he's still out there. <clears throat> and you've got this barbecue body. 
<coughs> a barbecue body on this this I don't know autopsy table, but it's Len Hendricks or Jeffrey Kramer playing that guy, and it's funny how he must have swapped from I can't be doing with all the killings and the gore of Amity Island to where did he go and transfer to? Fucking Haddonfield. In the history of you know career changes, not wasn't one of the best. As it happens, uh, Captain Ron sent me previously uh, a comic in the What If range of unbelievably Hendrix, Len Hendrix. Because in the first two stories, in it in the first story, Roy Scheider's chief Brody has died, and the mayor was apparently causing all the deaths. But they had an army of sharks. It's a very strange story. And, uh, and Len Hendricks exposes all this, goes down in a shark cage, fights the sharks, and then at the end of it, like, that's it, I'm out, I'm out of here. So he goes off to that town in Tremors. So he swaps waterborne sharks for sand sharks, the big sand worm things in Tremors, and he goes and battles them. It, and it's, it's a nice idea of taking a sideline, you know, supporting character in a, in a great movie franchise and giving him his own little stories, you know. I think it's great. But in a way, he'd only done it because in Halloween 2, he is the uh, the pathologist in Haddonfield. <laughs> Folks, that really is it, to be honest. I wanted to show you the artwork. Jaws, <laughs> the, the Kurt Choir, the Kurt Carolers, which is awesome. Um, and some classic horror stuff there as well. Vintage, universal horror. And an excuse to play some great music as well. And uh, to pave the way for what hopefully, let's, we've got another few days, another couple of weeks to uh, the big day. Let's really try and make the most of it. I've got, there's two uh, Christmas horror films I want to review. Violent Night, which is awesome, by the way. Uh, and uh, Christmas Bloody Christmas, which is, well, I had fun with it, but, because it's, it's nice and gory. But again, it's one of those movies where did someone write this script and write this dialogue? Fuck, 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 Just, it's endless fuckity fucks. I swear all the time, I do. But it's conversational and it's used for impact and it's used, you know, in descriptive, colourful, you know, vernacular. But if I'm writing a dialogue for a movie, I'm not going to have it in every other word. It's lazy, it's pathetic, it's not big, and it certainly ain't clever. And he did it in the uh, the Hellraiser reboot as well, which I reviewed and hated the film for many different reasons. But that was another reason, the amount of swearing, which was just unbelievable and totally ridiculously OTT and ultimately redundant. There you are. That was a hell of a good phrase, that, wasn't it? Uh, and I'm afraid uh, Christmas Bloody Christmas is the same. It's just, just too much of it. But I did enjoy it at the same time because it is, it's good old 80s style throwback hokum. Why are we going back to the 80s all the time? Look at Terrifier and Terrifier 2. They're throwbacks to 80s stalk and slash with practical effects, but also a completely devil may care. I don't, we're going to go beyond anything you've saw in the 80s, anything you've seen since, which they do. Oh boy, they do. Uh, now, these two other films, Violent Night is, well, it's, it's more, it's die hard, but with Father Christmas. And that is the, the only way of really looking at it. And it is a good idea, but it has sort of been done before. Only a couple of years ago, I reviewed Mel Gibson's film, The Fat Man, where he is Father Christmas, the real Father Christmas. But he's also a highly trained uh, special forces operative because he will have shootouts with Numerous bad guys and hitmen and assassins out to get out to get him. So it has been done, but this it has more of a, a die-hard and home alone atmosphere. That's Violet Night, by the way, not Christmas Bloody Christmas. Well, there you are. Just reviewed the two movies for you. Hey, it's great. <laughs> and it's uh, David Harbour, Sheriff Hopper from um, Stranger Things, and also Hellboy from Neil Marshall's ill-fated Hellboy reboot. Uh, he plays Father Christmas, and uh, I, I, I actually had quite a bit of a ball with that. And you've got the great named, great moniker, John Leguizamo. Leguizamo? Awesome. Mm. So there you go, we've done 
The Kurtz, we've done Jaws, we've done Universal Horror, we've done Christmas and Christmas horror movies. Um, what else have we done? Jeffrey Kramer, awesome. And uh, and we've discussed the plight of the world at this Yuletide season of uh, really, really discontent. Not good, but let's endeavour to have some fun at the same time. We'll get over it, we'll get by. Somehow or other, we'll get by. Another year is gonna roll in and we're all gonna be like, hey, despite the fact that we can't afford to do anything or party, and the weather's gonna to be too bad to go anywhere in the first place, you'll have parties over Zoom again. And uh, But we're gonna wish everyone all the best and hey, you know, roll out the barrel, it's gonna be great. 2023, come on now. We'll talk more. Some good movies due out 2023. So, live long and prosper, folks. I have been always shall be killed, man. Uh, forever waffling with irreverence and inanity. But with the good folks out there in the Kiltic clan, we have just tremendous inspirational artwork and just stuff that gets us going, you know? The music's fantastic, isn't it? In fact, you're going to have to listen to this. This is Ben Gardner's boat. got to tell you something. My mum just passed away and we had the funeral last week and uh, me and my brother gave eulogies. He start, he, they're all older than me, I'm the youngest. And um, my brother Steve, who's Canadian now, he's been there about 25 years. He did all of the thank yous. It was almost like an Academy Awards speech. You thanked everybody, you know, he, 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 who are you? What's your name? Well, thanks for being here. Whatever you've done, thank you anyway. And then he said at the end of it, because I was trying to gauge I don't use the notes. I, I, I'm just going to stand there and just, you know, by the, the seat of me kilt and just wing it. That's all I was going to do. I've got plenty of memories and I can always talk. You guys know this. So, uh, but I wanted to see what kind of tone he'd start and uh, how drastically I'd have to change it. But he did it really well. And at the end of it, he said, uh, you know, I was always the favourite because he was the youngest. He goes, until he came along, me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, everyone was roaring with laughter and it was great it was, it was the, the perfect way to I introduce me he was, anyway now here's the main event so I'll hand it over to my brother <laughs> so I got up there and amongst many other stories I told um, and you know some emotional stuff as well like obviously you've got to try again keep the balance be upbeat be optimistic but also you know it's a sad occasion at the same time and I did discuss this scene from Jaws. Why? Because me, me mum, big kilt mama, and me dad, big kilt papa, way back in the 70s, and it wasn't the first release, I don't think. Or if it was, the Jaws came out and Jaws stayed, didn't it? It would be the it would still be the same release. And I'd be what, six, seven years old. Had the novel, had Peter Fenchy's novel as well. And I'd seen the film. So it wasn't even the first time watching it. We were at the cinema. I went to the cinema in somewhere in North Wales, and it was busy. It was packed, and in a very touching moment, my mum and dad were holding hands. And I remember being a kid and thinking, "Oh wow, that's that's lovely." I, I wasn't cynical. I, there was no sense of me of, of a jaded, you know, sort of observation about you know older people and not being in love anymore. No, I just thought, "Oh, that's that's really nice." That you know, I hope me and my future bride are going to hold hands. Fat chance, because my wife's got claws, talons, and I don't want to get your hand ripped to shreds. I jest. She's got no hands, I chopped them off a long time ago. Uh, they're holding hands, and we get to this bit, and I just thought, oh, this is wonderful. I look at them, but they're excited about the movie as well, like, and we know what's coming. We all know the exact second that Ben Gardner's head's going to come lolling into view in that jagged hole in the hull of his boat. And you, you've got Matt Hooper's there. What's that? Oh, oh. Gets the tooth out and all that. The tooth the size of a shot glass. From the wrecked hull of a boat out there. It was Ben Garner's book. It was all bound up. You should have seen him. <laughs> Bro, he's all over the show. And uh, everyone, it's packed. You can hear the pin drop, like John Williams' spectral music's playing. You know, don't worry, Martin. You know, it's going to be okay. Now, why don't we just tow it in? Well, we will, we will. 
It's got to go on down, go down there and check that hole. The yellow light for un his under oh, Hooper's fantastic yacht, which even to this day, looking at that yacht, endured from 1975-76. You know, that boat still looks like one of the most fucking, you know, ultra-modern, fantastic vessels you could possibly ever have. You get the late show on this thing? No, it's closed circuit TV. I have cameras, underwater cameras fore and aft. <laughs> and he's down there in the sickly yellow light cast from the lights underneath his own yacht. And he comes up underneath the hull. Oh, God. And then... And we're all sitting there in a cinema tent. 200 people or whatever. And for a cinema in North Wales, that's quite a big turnout. You know, and then suddenly, suddenly... Come on, Ben. My mum yanks back on my dad's thumb. Because he's holding his hand. And my dad, who at that stage in his life was the size and weight of a small rhino, leapt about 10 foot in the air, dragging my mum with him. So the two of them were in the air. Everyone had jumped, but my dad screaming, yelping, like he'd just been, like he was a beached whale, yelping. Do beached whales yelp? But anyway, he's up in the air with me mother. What goes up must come down. And they came crashing down, sending a shockwave through amongst all the rest of the cinema seats in our row, our aisle. Boom! Everybody else went up, didn't they? Except for me. And why didn't I leap in the air? Not because I was some kind of horror guru and very experienced, even at my young tender age. No, because I was sitting in between me mum and dad and they were cosily holding hands across me. So when they, the thumb got yanked back, up they went, down they came, their hands still locked, I was imprisoned. Everybody else shot up in the air. It was a spectacular event. Cheers, mum. So... You got way more than you bargained for. Ronnie, fantastic stuff. Love it, love it, love it. Um, there are reviews coming. There are, why am I doing this? There are reviews coming. There's other stuff coming. There'll be other unboxings. There's actually something quite quite special coming. Well, special to me. And uh, so I can't wait for it to arrive. But there's a fucking postal strike and it's coming via Royal Mail. Damn it! It's not coming via the usual couriers who are still operating. It's coming by a fucking postman. Shit. So I might get it sometime in 2023. Anyway. It's the 4th of July. And those beaches will be open. Please keep it close and keep it chaotic. I'm going to see you all. Shark! Shark's in the estuary! It's going into the pond! What now? says Brody. What now? <laughs>